a great like Dr. Babur Karsa. So you have heard of this term, all roads lead to Rome. It seems today in the minds of the common orthopedic surgeon, whenever they see our baby end, they think that all, you know, eventually everything leads to arthroplasty. I just wanted to disabuse you of this notion and share my journey of the last 33 years in practice. The various journeys that can lead to hip preservation. So, the thrust of my talk is microvascular and surgical dislocation, but I want to show you the different stages through which my evolution and the chances that I got. So, this was a young businessman for whom we used a triple centrifuge technique in the blood bank at Jaslo. The 600 ml of bone marrow aspirate was taken, triple centrifuge and bone marrow, not with any of the modern systems. And here he is, six years after the surgery, with very minimal osteophyte formation and cam formation, which is something I will deal with in a, in a short while. So, but the two tested techniques of the yesteryears, where the muscle pedicle grafting done several years ago in this gentleman, this is a TFL muscle pedicle graft, and despite the X-ray that doesn't look beautiful at all, this gentleman, who at the end of 15 years has this kind of an appearance, has this kind of a function. And I like, I will highlight this. What is it that makes these some people achieve this kind of result very soon? So sometimes we are tempted to use the non-vascularized bullet graft. It is a very standard method and it can be done in various ways. So we can just, without opening the hip, we can go to the core decompression approach and put in this kind of... Uh, uh, and this is six or seven years later and you can see some osteophytes have formed. The avascular necrosis has healed. The bone has become strong. But he has excellent function, he has no complaints. There, there again, look at the physiognomy of the patient. And that should give you a clue as to what is happening. In some patients, we want to give them the best chance. The modern techniques of surgical dislocation of the hip. When I was in uh, Inselspital Bern in Switzerland, where they started surgical dislocation, they started performing in 2017 for all the vascular necrosis. Surgical dislocation along with osteotomy, which is which will surprise many of you. This is a young lad with a very painful hip like this, and you can see he's about to collapse. There's a subchondral lesion, and so we decided to perform surgical dislocation of the hip for him. These are some of the steps I hope that some of you can see the lower ones. This is exposing the this is cutting the capsule with the head in C2, and here we have used a junk, uh, approach like the light bulb, which is at the head neck junction. Through that, we are resecting the bone of the red bone, and then we are adding bone graft like this over here, and then switching back the flap with very thin micro. So, and this is a surgical dislocation that has been put back, the trochanter comes back, the gate is closed, and this is his appearance, and this is his kind of function. There again, take a look at his physiognomy to get a clue that perhaps the surgeon is or the surgery is perhaps not the only reason for the success. Sometimes you can afford to get a little, you know, enthusiastic and experimental. This young lad was a little heavy set and with this kind of lesion, he was willing to try out some of the newer techniques. So we decided to use bone morphogenetic protein. This is something some surgeons in the US are using, not just your bisphosphonates. So these are steps of the surgical dislocation of the hip. These are two oscillating saws. We make an oblique cut in the trochanter to open. And this is the appearance of the femoral head. And um, you know, very small area is where the cartilage is, you know, you, is going to give you trouble later on. You know this. And we make this opening, this is the triangle approach with which this is the best way in which we can really resect all the dead bone. We can get complete access to it. It's hard to believe that through the, you know, cold decompression circular cylindrical window, you can remove the eccentric. Though I have seen this wonderful instrument that you have, but the trapdoor approach does give us a wonderful. So this is, um, you know, at the end of which we put bone graft, 
getting bone graft from my recent favorite is the tibial bone graft. This uh, neck grafting is very innovative. I am sure it, it has, it takes use. Think global, act local, you are acting locally. It's wonderful. The tibial bone graft is not at all having any morbidity and you can harvest a lot. And then at the end of it, we added some BMP. The BMP comes as an injection wire and two sheets of collagen which you place underneath the subcondral bone, there's bone graft. So we, we first place the collagen, one collagen sheet at the bone graft and then second collagen sheet and on top of that bone graft underneath the cartilage. The collagen sheet with the BMP is always in touch with fresh bone. And this is his result at the end of uh, four or five years. And this is his kind of function. And a little bit of the restriction of hip range of motion can possibly be explained by the you know, the physiognomy of this patient. More about it later. So what is happening to all of these patients? What is the natural history of the disease and what's the role of bisphosphonates? AVM will heal itself in a year and a half to two years. The body, there is osteoclasis and there is refilling of the bone with new bone with osteoplasts. But in this period, the cartilage, you know, collapses and osteophytes, can osteophytes start forming because of softening of the head. So when that happens, the patient gets symptoms and pain due to the osteoarthritis or the impingement. That is what is happening. So when patients come to us several years down the line, this is the young lad came to me many, many years ago. This is following fracture neck humor, he developed avascular necrosis. You see the trouble and blood sign. And so what we did was an osteotomy for him. This was done more than 26 years ago. This is a medial displacement osteotomy, like a is, and a distal osteotomy because he's lost bone, he's shortened, with a little translation of the distal fragment. We recur, you know, his tendinal birth became negative, limbness became equal, we added three centimeters of lengthening. There's no lurch, there's no pain. And this was taken 22 years after his fall. He's an executive working in Mumbai. And these are his excellence. So the medial displacement has helped to reduce. These are the principles of Bombay and Powers. There's a book called The Biomechanics of the Hip by Renat of Bombay. We had come to Bombay Hospital in 1990, if I'm mistaken, or 1988. He's from Italy and he's an ardent follower of Powers. So this is part of the Makkari. So whenever you want to reduce the loading on the hip, you immediately displace the subtrochanteric osteotomy. And you can see because of the distal osteotomy, his mechanical axis is completely normal and so are the limblets. Even though the head doesn't look perfectly normal and there is some impingement, the patient has very few symptoms as you can see by his function. So the myth is that once the head is deformed, only a total hip will do the job. This is a young man from Rajasthan. You can look at his following the fracture like femur on a two lateral x-ray, look at this huge cam osteophyte and that is giving rise to his symptoms. So instead of thinking of the most dramatic thing, what we can do is do the surgical dislocation as described by Reinhold Gans. The patient is in the lateral position and you take a slightly curved incision. You find the Gibson syndrome between the gluteus maximus and the, uh, you know, behind. You isolate the pyriforms. The pyriforms is the key to the hip from behind. And you stay entirely superficial to the pyriforms. You do not go posterior to it. You go between the pyriformis and the gluteus minimus. Just posterior to the pyriformis is the second accessory supply to the hip. And that is the, you know, the collateral that joins from the inferior gluteal artery. But the main vessel you know is from the medial circumflex femoral. So if you stay above the pyriformis, you are going to be entirely safe. And then you create this Z-shaped capsuloplasty or capsulotomy. You approach the hip, you totally externally rotate so that the head comes out. And this, the leg is placed in a steroid bag on the opposite side. So if you keep the elevation of the head less than 11 centimeters, it will not stretch the medial circumflex femur and you will not develop secondary or iatrogenic area. So here he is with the head out and you can see we are using an osteodome to remove the cam osteophytes and now this offset has been very nicely recreated, okay? So that when he goes back, 
who has excellent function, full range of motion of the hip. And on the AP and lateral, all the osteophytes are gone. So remember, this is in the late stage. I wrote this up in the Indian Journal of Orthopedics in the year 2015. We have done, this was the largest series of surgical dislocations of the hip from India at that time. One more example of ABL like this, presenting in the late stage after fracture neck femur. You can see the large cam osteophytes that are formed and are blocking hip movement. <clears throat> and with the surgical dislocation, you can get rid of it, ensure the blood supply is maintained. Now, just one more example of this. Do you think a total hip is needed in all patients like this? This is the young lad, fracture neck femur, DHS was done. This is his appearance. He's 22 years of age and he can't walk more than one or two steps. This is his appearance. What do you think can be done for this patient? What is it? Nothing else. All roads lead to Rome. <laughs> so what we can do is an implant with a head reduction osteotomy. Okay, so this is a this is a trochanteric flip osteotomy. The hip is exposed, the gluteus maximus is in the front. And we are exposing, beginning to expose the femoral head. Now this is the femoral head. Here, what you can see is this is the medial side, okay? And this is the lateral side. And this is the in-between area, which is the saddle side depression with the extreme damage to the femoral head. So all we have to do is resect the central part, okay? All along, we are seeing that the blood supply of the femoral head is intact. You can see the bleeding, and then you can see this is the lateral, this is the medial, and we coat this like this with a very tiny, you know, very gentle cut, which is not a complete cut that allows these pieces to come together. I didn't have very, you know, excellent screws, but I just used this counter sunlight a little bit and got a semblance of a space. He put the head back in, and this is how he looks. Uh, you know, a couple of months down the surgery, the trochanter is fixed back. These are the screws that are fixing the head. And uh, this is after a couple of years. This is three years down the line. This is only one year down the line. It's got good hip flexion, but no rotations at this stage. But this is actually not seven. This is actually now 13 years after surgery. This is his range of motion. Even his external rotation has got very little restriction. The rotations take a lot of time to come back. And this is his kind of function. His Harris hip score is more than 90. And these are his current, is the x-rays, they're not the most beautiful, but his function, there is no fault in his function. He has, he can walk 10 or 11 kilometers. There's absolutely no problem. Perhaps again, the answer possibly lies not in the skill of the surgeon, but in the physiognomy of the patient. The truth is, Every time you see a patient who is thin and lean, your heart can sink because he's going to do well. Every time you see a patient who is, you know, will enjoy life, probably will not enjoy a good function in his hip joint. Finally, coming to microvascular surgery. This is a little, in today's day and age, with all this wonderful Ganga gel, Samsung water, and all the wonderful gases that we can inject our patients with. Microvascular surgery seems like a both Junilavanika. So I apologize, but let me share this passion we had. So we used vascularized tubular grafts. This is the great professor Jim Mardanek from Duke University, who's done more than 3,000 microvascular tubular graftings. And we met him in the year 2016. He was an emeritus professor at Duke University. And this is my wife, Dr. Mrs. Puna, who is the main microvascular surgeon. I help in all the other steps of the surgery that take 10 to 12 hours. So these are some very simple examples. This is the fibula, temporarily fixed with a pin. You can see some of these hemoclips over here, which are telltale signs that this is a microvascular. So these are some articles he wrote. This is Professor Urbana. And in pre-collapse osteonecrosis, so we have done the pre-collapse stage. You can see the steps, the guide wire, the lemurs. And we put this guide to make sure that we've done a thorough removal of the dead bone. And uh, then the track and then the fibula goes in. These are the hemo, these are the clamps, the vascular clamps. I'll explain it in a little while the approach. And this is the kind of appearance. And this is the patient whose, whose surgery this was. And uh, you, can, you can see all the tiny hemoclips over here. 
And this is his result, six years down the line. This is the, uh, this is the incision that Professor Albanek likes. It's a curved incision, and it helps you to go in the front of the hip. This is his range of motion. He's able to work in the farm. I couldn't find the, the video that shows him doing the minda and the kurma in the fields, which he can squat and do. He has absolutely zero pain. And the 10 hour surgeries, the 12 hour surgeries that we have to perform could be justified by these kind of results in some patients. And he has zero morbidity, even though he's well built and strong and muscular, he's not necessarily thin and lean. So there's another approach that we have used. This is a young man, but you can see the tendon in the merge early ADN. This is an approach where we use a slightly simpler microvascular graph taken from the medial femoral condyle. You know, the descending genicular artery vascularizes the periosteum. This is a favorite flap done by microsurgeons for small nonunions of the scaphoid, lunate, and certain nonunions. You get a very thick periosteum from the medial femoral condyle. You can harvest the bone graph from there. The vessel has got six to seven centimeters of the pedicle length you get. And so we, we ream, we put in the dye over here, and here we have taken only the light bulb approach and the patient is supine, not in a lateral position. So in the in the Huber Wolfman approach, when you there is you know when you pull back the TFL and you elevate the rectus femoris, underneath that the ascending branch of the lateral circumflex femoral is coming, which is more or less the same diameter as these donor vessels. And the anastomos this this is the light bulb approach. You can see the vessels have been um, this is the microvascular team. These are the experts who are doing the final stage of the surgery. And this is the, what we want to see in the surgery is finally the vessels pulsating. And you know, the periosteum has been put inside after the decompression and the grafting. And with this, this is the kind of result he has. And he has got great range of motion. And So you can climb stairs, sit down, tie his shoe bases and do everything. There are no virtual, no restrictions and uh, probably justifies the extreme, you know, efforts that we have to take. So I will end and summarize with three things. Now when the patient with avascular necrosis comes to me, I have understood what to tell the patient. I tell him just as one motorcycle won't last you your life, one car doesn't last last you an entire lifetime, one house doesn't last you a lifetime, very often one wife doesn't last you a lifetime. <laughs> In the same manner, one surgery is not going to last you a lifetime. Because when he's doing this for 33 years, after 4 or 5 years, when they develop these osteophytes, they have some pain, they, some, they come and complain to you. So you tell them at the very beginning. Second stage, you are going to develop a little arthritis. If your acetabulum is good, we are going to do this CAM osteoplasty, we are going to remove the CAM osteophytes. If, we, if somebody has the ability to do it with an arthroscope, we can do it with an arthroscope. But of course, with a scope, you can't go all around. In the surgical dislocation, you can get a 360 degree view of the head. If your acetabulum is involved and if you are really extremely active, if any of you have seen the Australian Open, this year, has anybody seen the Australian Open matches this year in January? You must have in the passing. I play tennis every day, so I, I watch. Andy Murray was playing, he reached the third round. He played a match for six hours. Just take a minute more. You know, he has a Birmingham hip resurfacing. Okay? So the Birmingham hip resurfacing surgery for young active and not the debut Articular surface replacement. This is the original Birmingham hip resurfacing done by Derek McMinn and is done all over the world still by a few surgeons with a special metallurgy, with a large head, with a different alloy. In the stage of arthritis, is not in the acute stage. It needs very good dense bone for the cap to seed and with the central pay. So that comes after a few years if your patient is really demanding. If the acetabulum is good, you can do a CAM osteoplasty. This way, you can defer arthroplasty until the fifth or the sixth decade. I thank you so much for your attention.